Welcome everyone to the third week of the Advisor Ambassador Program. What around what would it be normally the third week, but it's now kind of been the makeshift second weeks of this uh, July series here. But I uh, just want to welcome everyone. Thank everyone for joining us. Uh, this is our Master Your Brand, Maximize Your Growth class today, and we are very excited to be joined by Brian Haney, who was just featured on our uh, NAFA Live series and is a uh, longtime regular to this program, and we're uh, always happy to have him. He's spoken on a number of topics, and uh, apparently today he's got some very exciting updates to his uh, to his presentation. I'm really looking forward to hearing about that. If you do have any questions for Brian, you can use the chat feature in Zoom. I'll go ahead and type a message here, right there, so you all know where it is. That way, if you have any questions, we can just sort of uh, have a good dialogue for this class today and. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. But Brian, I'm going to go ahead and uh, not take up any, any of your time here so you can just roll right through. Welcome. Appreciate it. Thanks, Zach. Uh, I am, I, as I was telling Zach, as some of you were getting on, I am thrilled to do this. This is a literal master class today because I'm, I'm revamping and developing this for a uh, top of the table presentation that's going to happen in a couple months. So uh, you guys are going to get some new really good stuff. So fasten your seatbelts. I'm going to go quickly and uh, just try to hang on, uh, take as many notes, but stay engaged because it's going to cover a lot of ground, but it's going to be really, really, really good. Uh, covering things that, depending on where you are in your practice or how many years you've been in the business, these are things that I wish I had been told in my first, you know, 12, 18, 24 months. Um, so, it, it, and it also matters whether you've been in 12, 18, 24 months or 24 years. So, it's going to be really good. Um, as Zach mentioned, I want to get everybody's engage, engagement right now. So if you have any pressing question or something that you just wanted to know, what the heck is branding all about? What is it, you know, what is this about? How do I use technology? Whatever it is, uh, go ahead and start now um, putting any of these questions in uh, the chat box because I'm going to try to make sure if I don't cover them throughout the presentation, Zach's going to be able to keep track of them and then we'll hit them at the end. Uh, so. Go ahead, any pressing questions, any bright ideas, otherwise I'm gonna get started. I'm gonna cover, like I said, a lot of ground. So we're gonna quick scan of the landscape because I don't know what types of practices everybody has, but I'm gonna make sure that no matter what, we're gonna go through and level set where we are as an industry. Uh, I'm gonna really dig into the concept of branding um, because that word might not mean a lot to you. It certainly didn't mean a lot to me when I got started in the industry and frankly, I was you know, I had been in it, uh, in the banking side of it for five years before I really started to even, you know, understand a sliver of that concept. It's really important and powerful. I'm going to go through every element of a brand uh, with you uh, and what that can look like for you. We're going to talk about content uh, and then really end with ways that you can uh, actively create some content or leverage certain things. So that way, um, you know, when you have a brand that's working for you, you're able to engage the audience in the market in the right way. So this can be really, I don't know about you guys, but uh, it's been a weird year. Um, it's a dumpster fire and a colonoscopy prep all rolled together. So um, hopefully the pandemic hasn't impacted your practice too much, but it, it, it may have. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard people telling me everything from they're having some of their best months ever. And I've heard other people, even people that have been in the business for a while saying they're really struggling, you know, not being able to see people or do certain things or not have the same capacity to impact their practice based on the pandemic. Um, so it's across the board, but hopefully that, you know, to me, everything's a silver lining. There's always opportunity and challenge. So, you know, what is this revealing to you that can really allow you to galvanize that challenge? I, I encourage every single person, lean into the tension. Whatever tension exists, lean into it. That way you can figure out how to, you know, transform things and come out of this on the other end way ahead of schedule. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, you just need to be pressed on enough. So we're going to find some ways to grow and I'm going to help you do that. And like I said, like it or not, with or without a pandemic, we are in a fully digital economy. This has only accelerated things that already existed. And the thing that I always like to remind everybody is, guess what? Disruption is the name of the game and technology isn't going backwards. This, this isn't a fad. The, the internet is here to stay. Facebook, LinkedIn, all this stuff. We're not going back to flip phones or rotary, right? I think hopefully everybody agrees with me. And just think about that, right? Think about all the disruption that's happened in the last two to five years where you see the world's largest taxi company that doesn't own a taxi. 
or the largest distributor of movie and, and film content is not, you know, uh, a Miramax or, you know, a Sony producer video, like every single, most of, of not just the entertainment, but most of how we do life has been radically disrupted. And that also means our industry has. So I always want to just kind of make sure I said, I'm going to level set in a lot of ways. I don't know where you're coming from and I don't know what kind of practice you have. And sometimes in every room, whether I'm doing this in person or virtually, somebody said, you know, I don't know that disruption is really all that significant to our industry. So let me, let me go ahead and try to answer that naysayer if that naysayer is on this presentation. So anybody that runs an AUM focused practice, these numbers should be staggering. They're actually probably two years old. Uh, from from what I could get in the data management side, they're they're at least they're at least twelve months old, uh, and they've only grown. So ask yourself this: uh, you know, is your practice res ready to compete with the idea of, hey Alexa, go ahead and rebalance my portfolio for me? Next up, how many of you do any kind of disability? You know, when I, when I talk to some of the other NAFA folks, some of them that are serious DI producers, uh, I want to introduce you to Breeze. You may not have met Breeze yet, but now you're going to. You can check this out. What is this? This is a direct to consumer disability website. No agents, no commissions. It's a very well built site and it makes it easy for somebody who doesn't have disability and is looking to get it um, to go in through a very, you know, easy underwriting type of process, an online digital experience, and, and get that done for them. And oh, by the way, what company do you think is behind this? I'll go ahead and answer. It's a surety, one of the major disability carriers in the industry. Oh, and for those of you that like to do life insurance, which probably cuts across a lot of us, I imagine, to in some or significant parts, I'd like to introduce you to Haven Life. If you've never met Haven Life, Haven Life, again, it's a great place to go to get direct to consumer, up to $3 million of affordable term coverage and right, quotes are good, but real rates are better. Now, here's the, the, the million dollar question. Which company do you think supports Haven Life? Yep, I'll go ahead and answer it quickly. It's Mass Mutual. I was a career agent and still a broker for Mass Mutual for 10 years. They are one of the true blue, old school long-term career agency model systems as as true as they come and yet they have created and produced and now and this is by the way haven life it's five years old so this has been out there for a little while directly competing against the entire agency field because there's no commissions involved direct to consumer if your largest career agency shop that manufactures products in the life insurance space has now manufactured one that doesn't involve agents, you just need to understand disruption is happening in our industry. So this is our new reality. And this is what I mean. I want us to all understand this and embrace this. Like it or not, a significant portion of any person's financial experience can now be done without us. Whether that's good, right, you know, doesn't matter what we think, feel, or whether or not that's even a valuable thing for people to consider. It's here and it's here to stay. So what are you gonna do about it? Now I wanna introduce you to the idea. We're talking about branding. So I kind of went through all of this and then it seems like a little bit of a shift gear back to old branding. Why do I talk about branding? What is that all about? Whether you're an independent practitioner and you kind of have, you know, it's, you know, John Smith LLC or Inc or whatever it is, if you have your own trade name, or even if you're an agent for a career shop or an independent shop or you've got a larger carrier supporting you, a Merrill Lynch, doesn't matter. You still need to get in the mentality of developing a brand because what a brand is, it's not just what you do, it touches who you are. It touches why do you exist? Why are you, why do you matter to your clients and to the general public at large? Why should somebody work with you based off of not just your professional capacity, but who you are as a person and the things that you value? How can you replicate more of yourself, not just be a better professional, right? How can you magnify certain things that people actually find really important and appealing? And how can you offer that? Because there's 
30,000 members of NAFA, that means that's, you know, not the entire industry at large, but there's 30,000 people just like us. So how do you stand out from the crowd, right? And how can you grow this brand dynamic, not just try to grow things through product lines and product sales? Different mentality here. To help you kind of frame this paradigm a little bit further, I want you to, don't close your eyes because we're on a Zoom call and I don't want you to fall asleep, but Think back for a second about the last amazing restaurant experience you had. And I bet if you did close your eyes and you really did this exercise with me, you could probably even a part of your, you, you know, sometimes people start salivating, right? Those images about good food and a good dynamic are very, very powerful, right? Psychosomatic response is, is incredible. Think about the last great vacation that you took. Geez, when, when, when we could travel, right? You know? Where did you go? Can you still feel the breeze on your face and the sand under your feet? I bet you can. You really think about it. And the point of all those things is that no, it's not about tacos. What do those memories have in common? I would venture a guess. I bet they have people involved. I bet you didn't go there alone, right? And oh, by the way, when you have a great experience, when you came back from that restaurant or back from that vacation, did you tell anybody about it or did you keep it to yourself? Did you not post a single picture of your vacation online? You were just like, ah, I just had the most amazing vacation ever. But nobody would know unless you're in the secret service spying on me. No, you told people about it because that's what we naturally do as human beings when we have a good experience, right? Restaurant, it wasn't just about good food, although you, there better be good food, otherwise you're not going back. You had great service, you know, you might have had a fun, engaging conversation, you might have been with somebody you really cared about. All of these things weave together. That's what makes that experience memorable. And that's why you will go back versus you won't, right? Same thing with a va vacation. I've already said it. It's all about experience. And so that's the next step in understanding a brand. How does someone, a client, a prospect, a friend, a neighbor, a center of influence, how can they experience me? What kind of an experience is it like to work with me as a practitioner or to work with my agency? And to not just think about, well, I deliver this policy and then there's a renewal, but you really wanna think of the totality of that because remember, that's why before I even got to this point, I talked about the fact that people can do most of the stuff that you probably do professionally without you being involved, you know? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a slide for the PNC part of the business because that's been an issue. That part has been commoditized for a long time. You know, there's select quote, direct quote, you know, your brother's quote, your mother's quote. It's, it's all already out there, right? So we get that, but that has only expanded. What kind of an experience can you be delivering that separates you out from the crowd and has people raving telling their friends about it and wanting to come back for more. So here's a question and I do want you to answer. So this is chat box time. Zach, you need to give me the top two or three. How do you tell someone, this is what I do. Pretend you're in a networking and function. What's your elevator pitch? How do you, your friend says, hey, what do you do for a living? What's your answer? I need to see at least one or two answers just to show the people are alive. Come on, if you get, get the answer in first, you win a prize. Robert, Ray, Andrew, here we go. We got a contender. Tell me how you answer this question. I'm a financial advisor. You want to work with me? <laughs> so we got a money coach and financial GPS in there. Okay. Those are words. Give me a sentence. What do you say? I like the money coach, build, up, build that, create that from a, from a sentence standpoint. I just asked you, hey, money coach, or hey, whoever that was, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that I'm a money coach? Give me the full sentence. You're scared, you don't wanna do it. That's okay, all right, we'll keep going. We can come back to it. Second question, maybe the more critical one, why do you do what you do? Okay, this one, Hopefully you're answering in a sentence or you can give me, you can either give me a sentence or you can give me some really powerful words that deal with things like, you know, financial empowerment or 
you know, I'm passionate to help people fill in the blank, right? Anything like that. We got one from Andrew here. I help people achieve their goals and dreams. Beautiful. Dreams are awesome, right? It's kind of what we were dialing back into when we were talking about experiences, right? Dreaming, thinking back. Okay. The second answer to that question, your why, is all about what do you believe? And right here, you might be wondering what this amazing picture, I know I probably pulled it out of a magazine, right? No, actually, shockingly enough, that is my wife and daughter. That is my why. This is why I do what I do, because I got to take care of these amazing young ladies at home and make sure that we just have as great of a lifestyle as we can. And then there's a bunch of other things too that are really important to me that have nothing to do with what I do professionally. I'm passionate about you know, social uh, injustice and income inequality and you know, eliminating poverty. I've been on mission trips to help refugees because most of us don't realize we continue to be in the largest mass migration human crisis in our, in literally human, human history. Um, you know, those are some of the things, again, all of those things are important to me that funnel into what I do as a professional, but a lot of times, you know, not things that we communicate. So hopefully you're getting some, you know, new ideas. Well, why is it, why does all this matter? What you believe matters because people will buy what you believe more than they might buy the stuff that you provide. How many of you have ever heard of Tom's shoes? Don't have to answer whether you have or whether you haven't. You've probably at least seen this little logo around. But if you've heard of them, you might not have heard about the story of Tom's shoes. Tom's shoes is an example of a brand that was built around this concept of social entrepreneurship, right? We've seen a lot of these types of stories. Tom's recognized that there are tons of, of people that don't even have shoes around the globe. So for every box of shoes you buy, they donate a box of shoes to somebody in need. Now, is it about the shoes? At that point, did, 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 did we need another shoe provider? Is Nike, Adidas, all the other ones, was, was there enough? Isn't there enough already? No, but they realized, hey, I can not only produce something of quality, but if I tell you about why I'm doing what I'm doing, and that it goes beyond just shoes, they took off immediately and, and you know, within years became a multi-million dollar organization overnight because it wasn't about just the shoe. It was about their story. So what I would encourage you to do, it's a little picture of, of again, I was delivering a, a check for a foundation that was part of my why, right? We are not in the insurance, or investment business. We are in the human transformation business. And if you don't believe that, think about it and call me later because I need you to start to believe that. If you don't realize that what you do has so much significance, then you know, hopefully just by the, at least by the end of this presentation, you're a little bit more jazzed than you were before. But think about those words, human transformation business, because I want that to be something that we're gonna try to build on, right? That's communicating differently. That's not financial coach, financial advisor, PNC, this, that, whatever. How do I change and transform your life? How can I help make money? Not the number one reason why couples get divorced, right? How can I move the needle in a meaningful way? What story can you start to tell? So a long-winded lead-in in a branding dynamic to go back to how can I better answer the questions I asked you earlier? Why should somebody work with you? Why do the people that do work with you already, why did they pick you over somebody else? If you don't know the answer, you should absolutely ask your clients this because it's really great data and information and they'll tell you things that I bet have nothing to do with the policy or the investment that you did for them, okay? And then how do we reinforce this from a relationship standpoint moving forward because as hopefully most of us realize, delivering and landing the policy or making the investment is not the finish line, it's just the beginning, right? How can somebody then believe that you are truly, absolutely immeasurably valuable to them, so much so that they, you know, they don't want to see their success story without you being a part of it? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story super fast. Who am I? I'm actually, you know, an, a, an adult paper boy. I got started in, 
any kind of job delivering papers at eight years old. Now, how did that happen? Well, as most eight-year-olds uh, did, or maybe you've done, you know, I, I sat down at the breakfast table to my dad and said, hey, dad, I'd like an allowance. And to this day, I don't remember exactly how he told me no, but I do recall not hearing those valuable words, sure, son, let's make that happen. A couple of weeks later, he comes back in, same type of breakfast table dynamic, and slides me a paper, and he had something circled on it that said, hey, you know, local paper boy wanted, and he looks at me and said, you know, do you want to start to bring in some revenue? You want to get a job? And I was like, okay. In his mind, he thought I'd probably do this for a week and be done. Well, actually, that's not true. I delivered papers 365 days a year, rain or shine, to 72 houses from eight till I was 18 and graduated from high school. So that's part of my makeup. Now, why does that story even matter? Well, yeah, it's an interesting, cool story. Maybe not something that everybody would experience, but that was some of the most formative professional experiences I've ever had. And I'll tell you a very easy example as to what that is. When you think about paper delivery in general, especially if you know, you're, you're in a neighborhood, what's kind of the image that comes into your mind? It's probably something like that, right? Going out there and God knows what on early, I can't really find it, is it in the bushes, did a dog pee on it, was it rainy, wet, this, that. It's not the most dignified experience in general. Uh, I remember many times when I was just mortified, embarrassed, if my mom even came out with a bathroom on, I was like, whoa, like, what's going on here? Not acceptable. You got to get dressed up to go outside, folks. This is, so <laughs> I say all that, not to just make you laugh, but to realize what we decided to do is that how can we take something as simple as delivering a paper and give it dignity? How can we do this so well? What my dad drilled into me was, if you're gonna do anything, do it with excellence. So I had to figure out not just how I could do this quickly, how I could do this, you know, and just to get it done, be done by 5 a.m., 5.30, whatever it is. What did excellence look like in delivering a newspaper? So here's what we did. For every single 72 houses, we either brought, we brought the paper up to your door, we either put it behind your screen door, or if your screen door was locked, we put it under the mat. We always made sure it was protected from the weather, and all you had to do was literally open the inside of your door, and there was your paper. You didn't have to ever walk outside. Now think about that for a second. That's unique. And again, I was only eight when we kind of went through all of this. Um, but that was a transformative moment because that's the kind of framework that I've now carried into being a professional is that I might be doing something that a ton of other people can do, but if I'm going to do it with excellence, I'm going to do it so that way I understand my audience and what they are going to be experiencing. And I want that to be something so special and so valuable that there's no way they're going to want to do it from somebody else. And yes, after we finished delivering papers, my parents for two years later still got calls wondering, you know, why aren't you guys doing this anymore? Blah, blah, blah. It's, it's an incredible dynamic. So super fast because I'm, I know I'm, I'm on the clock and I got to go through every single one of these things. What are the elements of a brand? I mentioned this term brand. We've talked about this conceptually. We've talked about experience. We've talked about storytelling. We've talked about what's your why. Now let's go through literally every single part that could make up a brand dynamic. What do you think of when you see this logo? Not just a mouse, probably a place that you go. And oh, by the way, that word experience, right? Most of you may not realize this. Disney invented something uh, that you probably haven't heard of. It's called a money tree. And literally all they have to do is shake it and money falls out of your pocket. It's amazing. So that's Disney for you, right? Well, what story, maybe, maybe you have the ability to create some kind of a logo or you've thought about this or you have your own brand name or what have you. What story can a logo tell or can your logo tell? Ours, for example, has a bulldog, part of which as we were going through our brand development, we recognized that we wanted to have a mascot. Why? Because mascots are cool. No, because actually as we were thinking about who we were as professionals and why we did what we did, we were writing down a lot of, of you know, characteristics loyal, extremely caring, you know, funny. We started to build this profile for ourselves as professionals and we realized, man, there's a lot of that that might correspond with a bulldog. Also, my family, my, my parents who I work with in a family business, they happen to have English bulldogs, so we love that. And oh, by the way, for those of you that didn't know this, the English bulldog is the number one mascot in America. 
there you go. So there was a lot of reasons why it then came together, but the reality was the logo actually talked about who we were beyond just, you know, what we were delivering. And a lot of this brand component needed to now, so the logo tells its own story and people ask us about it all the time because it's different, it's unique. It doesn't look like, this doesn't look like the average, you know, industry logo or dynamic, right? This isn't a fidelity or mass mutual, whatever, it's unique. So it was a great way to stand out and it also helped us tell more of our story in a unique way. All right, this, a lot of people are gonna get in trouble. Because if I went on LinkedIn and I pulled all of you up, I hope this isn't what I'm going to read, but you know who you are. I'm great. I've been great for a long time. I grew up great, went to a great school, launched a great professional career. By the way, here's a list of all the great things I've accomplished. At my firm, we offer the following great products and services. I think you and I should work, you should work with me so that we can be great together. Yeah. Who wrote that bio? The answer to that question is not your clients or your target audience. And that's why I make light of this, okay? And please, hopefully you understand that that's satire, but this is how most people's bios read. And that's fine, but here's the problem with that. It's from your perspective out to your audience, trying to convince them why you're great. Why don't you consider your bio from your audience's standpoint. What would they actually want to read or see or understand about you? Change your framework. You want an example of that, go find me, look me up on LinkedIn and read mine and you'll see it's very, very different from this. You've got a website. Now, some of you, again, or a lot of you, maybe you work for a corporate entity, uh, you know, you're a mass mutual, you know, whatever it is. So you may not, not everybody has their own website, that's okay. But wherever you are in the digital space, you need to have some kind of a website presence where somebody can find you. Whatever that is and how much control you have over it, you want to know, you know, you, you want to be able to know that you've got to really control that content. And if it's yours, then, you know, you want it to stand out and be meaningful and be interesting. If it's not, you still want to work with your, 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 your branding, your, your compliance and all that to find what control you have and how much you can shape it and, and mold it so that way it communicates effectively and isn't just kind of an embedded experience in some sort of a greater corporate hierarchy that kind of buries you and doesn't allow you to stand out from the crowd. What about your profile picture? Are you on the left or the right? Notice something about my picture and yes that is what's on my LinkedIn profile. I don't look right at the audience. The average person's profile picture is us going like this, right? looking right at the camera, smiling. Some of the ones are pretty bad. Some of them are just kind of cropped out social media. I, I'm surprised at how many unprofessional profile pictures I still find on LinkedIn and a lot of other places. This picture even tells a story, right? I'm looking off in the distance. There are things that this kind of an image evokes. And I was intentional about that. I thought about that. You should too. Anywhere that there's an image before somebody meets you, if they're finding you online, you can be telling them a story. And things just like this matter a lot, right? Because like I said, go ahead and take a look at my own LinkedIn profile and see how different it is from yours and you'll understand why I'm talking about it this way and why it matters. Ever thought about the colors in your brand? Most people when I show the slide start to try to find their favorite companies, but we don't realize that colors give off a certain psychological message and that's important. And like I said, if you have the ability to choose your own colors or you've had your own independent brand, you should know what they stand for because that's another way that you need to be able to communicate and leverage that, right? If you have a corporate culture, if you're a mass mutual or if, again, the purple part for Northwestern, that's, I'm still trying to put all that together, but hey, that's what they've got and they're running with it. Fidelity's got green. It's good to know what these things mean in terms of a psychological response because you want to play to that, right? You want to find ways to, to take advantage of that. And you also want to, and I'll show you this in a little bit, you want to see how you can pull that in more for yourself and personalize it. So what other places can you have a brand identity where you can make an imprint on your customers or the people you're trying to attract? Any marketing material that you use, and this is, I want to make this point, especially if you're somebody that works with multiple companies and carriers. If you were like me five, six, seven years ago, 
you probably pulled things off the shelves from Jackson National or you know American National or whoever. You had some great pieces. They had their own great pieces, and that was fine, and you might have used them with clients. Here's the thing about that is that what you might be unintentionally doing is trusting in someone else's brand that they're communicating the way that you would want to communicate. But the problem is, is a lot of times we just like some material because it does something cool. We don't think about how it communicates to our audience. And if we're communicating in a different way and we're trying to pull somebody's stuff off the shelf and use it, what can happen is if it sounds different or it comes across differently, you, you're creating what's called cognitive dissonance, right? You're saying and acting in one way, and yet what the person is experiencing is a little bit different, and it causes people to kind of, they don't necessarily consciously think this way, but subconsciously there's a disconnect. That's why stuff like this is so important. You want there to be uniformity in the way that you communicate. And every material that you might be giving to a prospect in any, in any medium, you want to know what it's saying, and does that line up with the way that you want it to be saying something from your message, from your approach, from your experience, right? Feel free to give me a call and listen to my voicemail. Did you know that you can have an experience and an impact just in the way that you leave a voicemail? Go ahead and, and my cell phone will be at the end of this and you can call me up and I won't answer probably because a lot of times you can't reach me anyway because we're all busy and I don't always answer numbers that I don't recognize. And then you can hear my voicemail and then you'll have an idea. Why not have fun? How many people call you and end up leaving you a message? Tons of people. What a great opportunity to just have a different kind of experience. I can't tell you how many people still to this day tell me they love my voicemail. It's crazy, but it's simple. These are simple things, but all of these brand elements have value and they add up. You need to be able to stand out from the crowd because again, if you're competing against Alexa now, what are you doing, right? And by the way, attire, yes. The point that I'm getting at, you need to carry Consistency is key. You need to carry your brand across all mediums. Look at this picture. We've got stuff in the background. We've got the same ties. And yes, we do have bulldog socks, uh, a couple of different pairs, in fact. So we literally are very, very brand conscious. And that's great. And maybe you don't have the same capacity because you don't have your own independent brand, but there are still ways for you to be this brand conscious for yourself. Consistency is the key. That's right. Don't create cognitive dissidence. Don't say one thing on social media look different on LinkedIn, have a, a corporate brand that you haven't really figured out how to adopt and use for your own purposes, right? There's a lot of things that if I look at the average financial professional online, they're very inconsistent. And that hurts you more than it helps you, especially since more often than not, people are finding you digitally before they're meeting you. All right, now, what does this, how, how do I take all of this great knowledge that I've just covered all this stuff, I got a good brand, what do I need to do? All right, we're gonna talk super fast because I know I'm, I'm, I'm coming close to time. So, and there's actually a surprising amount left. In this digital economy, content is king. You probably heard that. If you haven't, you've heard it here first. Content is king. What does that mean? Why is that the case? Because 93% of buying decisions are influenced by content, by some form of digital medium or social media. And like I said, that's not getting rolled back. So buying behavior has absolutely changed, including people thinking about working with a financial professional. So if you are not using digital mediums properly, you're hurting yourself. 62% of millennials and Gen Zers feel that online content drives their loyalty. So if I have an existing relationship, a great way for me to effectively reinforce it is to deliver really significantly good quality content. Yet the content that they're receiving is turning them off because it's not helping them. It's not directed to them as an audience. A lot of the content that we put out as professionals is one way, where it's us thinking that this is something that's really good that I want people to know, right? But we're not actually sitting from the audience and trying to think of, well, how are they thinking? What is their issues? How can I meet my audience where they are instead of me broadcasting something to them and hoping that it lands right, why don't I take time to sit in their shoes and figure out how might I deliver something in a manner that they might want to hear? Time to disrupt yourself when it comes to digital mediums. Smarketing. Be a smart sales and marketer. How can you combine the two together? We're going to talk about this. This is a huge concept, folks. Inbound marketing. If you've never heard it before, I'm, I'm telling you what it is. Remember how I mentioned, you know, 
you know, putting content out. Most large financial organizations, they do outbound marketing and they do it a ton. And some of it's good, some of it's effective, but the reality is it's they're putting out a message that they think resonates with the marketplace. Sometimes it does, a lot of times it doesn't, but it's not necessarily from the audience's perspective, right? Cold calling, spam emails, right? Not, it's marketer centric. We need to switch gears. We need to figure out what is my client or my prospect thinking? How are they wanting to be communicated to? What things might they actually be interested in reading or connecting with or seeing online, right? How can I get into their head so that way I can deliver things that really lands well and invites them in? That's the point. How can you do content so well that it attracts people to you? So here's some examples and some information. How do you understand what this is, right? It's a tactic that's about attraction, bringing people in. How can you align your content better with prospects pain points and even in their own language, right? Because certain people might speak or communicate or think about a certain situation, not necessarily in what I like to call financial ease, right? How can I take something that might be complicated and make it simple? Make it provocative, make it something that people are like, oh, that, that actually made me think about X, Y, or Z, right? This is the difference between working smarter, not just harder. This is what I'm talking about. Most of us don't have this and have never thought about this. You need to have a buyer persona for your best client or your best prospect. Now, if you have good clients, you probably have some of this data. You've never thought about it maybe as strategically as this. So you want to, and sometimes maybe the place that you need to start is to connect with some of your best clients and just ask them some questions, pick their brain, because they'll give a lot of this data to you that can be really, really helpful and formative, right? How do they wanna be communicated with? And then how can I offer them something that starts to draw them in, right? Solve the pain, demonstrates that I hear them and I understand them and I wanna connect with them. 90% of millennials and Gen Zers will share their brand preferences online. World, word of mouth, right? Referrals is now world of mouth. Referrals are on digital steroids. You do this well, you've just armed an entire digital army of brand ambassadors that can go and be like, this guy's stuff is so great, you got to check him out, right? This takes referrals to a whole other level if you do this well. How do you do this? Most important thing is anything that you have or anything that you're trying to produce needs to provide value first. People like to experience you in part before they decide if they want to experience you in full. So a couple examples of what our practice does. I have a podcast, whole other story for a whole other day, how I decided to launch a podcast, but I did. And the big reason is it allows people to start to experience me before they ever pick up the phone or before I ever meet them or before I even reach out to them, right? There's a way for them to connect. They can hear what I'm about. How do I interview people? What's my subject matter expertise like? what kind of personality dynamic, all of these things they don't necessarily consciously think about, but that's what comes through when you're listening to something. I also wrote and published a book, The Retirement Income Pyramid, right? So I have things that I can actually have out that are of value that allow people to start to experience what it could be like to work with me as a professional. Effective content has to have these elements. It needs to be ultra specific, right? These, sometimes you put out things that are super general or very talkative or whatever. People don't go online to solve 10 problems. They go online to solve one problem. Here's a question and answer. What is the number two search engine? Google's number one. What's number two? If you can guess it right in the next 10 seconds, you win a prize. Don't mouth it, Zach. You might know the answer. I don't see anybody answering. Let's see. Did somebody get it? What's it being? Bing, incorrect. Number two search engine is YouTube. Why? Because there's a do-it-yourself video for everything these days, right? And equally important and powerful, video is a more effective medium of communication because we are not just auditory only learners. We're very, very visual in nature. In fact, the majority of information we take in, we take in not just by hearing or reading, Right? So that's why video is very powerful. And again, there's a do-it-yourself answer and video for just about everything under the sun. 
All right, but think about why that's been important when it comes to content creation and how you deliver content and what mediums you might want to use. How can you provide immediate gratification? How can you give somebody a little bit of an answer or help them out a little bit, right? How can you say, here's a white paper on something? I don't know if you've ever wondered about 412e plans. Here's a little white paper on that, right? How can you provide something that's easy to consume? If you say, hey, download this brochure, my brochure is 59 pages of a PDF, Ugh. Might be really great 59 pages, but I got to tell you, most people, even if they're willing to go through that and get that from you, probably don't read the whole thing. All right, I'm getting very close. How can you deliver things that have a high perspective of value? And you need to know what your audience would say is valuable to answer that question properly. And how can you shift the relationship and invite somebody to have a conversation with you? I think that's the biggest key there is that if content is king, do you think people want more content? No, they don't want more content. They want content that allows them to progress. They want content that helps them move the needle in their lives. And I think that that's probably one of the most powerful points that I hope you can, you can digest for yourself. How can you meet your audience where they are, right? Ha meet them on their terms and invite them into a conversation, into a relationship provide value before they ever connect with you, all right? How can we create an attraction marketing dynamic using digital mediums? Because it's not just about making sure that I have a post once a week or using some sort of, I'll get into some tools at the end. How do you measure success? So not everything, I just wanna say this, not everything will lead to an appointment and that's okay. You do need to create the proper and appropriate metrics for your marketing efforts, especially when it comes to online marketing. Because I, I will tell you, a lot of the stuff that we do as a practice online, ultimately, yes, would I like, you know, do I want it to generate leads? Yes, but a lot of times it's not necessarily about that. Much of it might be about brand enhancement, brand development, and elevating my brand profile to certain clients, you know, being seen as more of a subject matter expert. Some of it's actually about PR. Uh, developing more opportunities to speak or be interviewed or stuff like that. So, so for me, success isn't necessarily did I, you know, use the right script, put out the right post, and then somebody commented on it, and I managed to get them to become a client. That's not always it. Engagement's important because if you're putting out content and people are not liking it, reading it, commenting on it, et cetera, you need to ask yourself, is this good content? Because guess what? Your audience will tell you if it is or not. And if nobody's engaging with you, it's not. I'll just tell you that right now. What opportunities can you find in the content or in the platforms that you're on, right? Obviously, it's very easy to find somebody's birthday because Facebook tells us, right? And LinkedIn does as well and all this other stuff. But how can you celebrate your clients? How can you actually communicate to your audience in a way that doesn't have anything to do with, you know, what you do professionally, but has some meaning and some value? And how can you do that without just doing the generic, hey, this auto-populated to LinkedIn, hey, happy birthday or happy work anniversary or whatever. I always love how many people on LinkedIn send me those thoughtless. And yes, they are thoughtless because LinkedIn just does it for you. Happy work anniversary messages. While it's nice to get it, if there's no actual personalization to it whatsoever, it tells me actually, you know, think about what that tells you. If, you, if you've ever experienced that yourself, did you feel more inclined to work with that person or to know more about them or to care or connect? or if you knew it was just some sort of auto-generated thing that LinkedIn did, to kind of come across as thoughtless, not personal, not really invested. And yet, if we've done that ourselves, maybe we don't realize that's the messaging we're giving off. That's why all of this is really important. And you generate some virtual appointments. Can you actually, maybe instead of trying to have, you know, a virtual client meeting, maybe you create a virtual forum where you get a bunch of people together and you just facilitate a topic of interest. There's a lot of ways to engage that don't all necessarily have to be about the business component or a lead, all right? These are the steps. How do you do this? Step one, you need to know what you look like online. So the first thing I would ask you to do, Google yourself. And if you've never done it, or even if you've done it recently, do it again. See what you look like online digitally. If you don't like what you see, then you're gonna have some work, right? understand what it's gonna be like for somebody to find you. And where are you found? Is there any information out there that you don't like, don't want, isn't accurate? Are you in certain spaces you weren't aware of? 
it's important to audit yourself first. Audit your audience second. I've already mentioned all of the ways that we don't understand because we haven't been taught to think with an audience first mentality at all, right? So create that buyer persona so that way I know who my audience is and how I can connect with them effectively online. Create a year long plan. Obviously that's inclusive of digital marketing, especially since the pandemic's probably gonna continue for the end of the year and who knows for how long afterwards, but can also have some other touch points. You know, one of the things that's been really meaningful for us, for some of our group clients who do employee benefits, is we'll send, like during a renewal period or some off hands, like we'll send cupcakes to a group for their employees, right? Can you do just small, simple engagement things that build significant value for you relationally because it stands out, it's unique, and people love what you just did, and it was thoughtful. And then make sure that you have now a consistent strategy that you manage measure and engage with. So I want to talk lastly about, we're going to get to questions, comments, concerns, needs, desires, longings, and considerations. So now is the time to start typing in questions. I want to make one final point because I know this exists and because I had even used it myself in the past. Some of us, especially if we have certain broker dealer relationships or corporate, you know, support, you might've heard of things like hearsay social or marketing pro. There are certain companies that help you auto kind of do in a compliance friendly way, social media, right? So that way you don't have to be producing your own content. And by the way, most of us don't have the bandwidth to produce our own content and probably shouldn't because we're may we maybe not even be that good at it. But I need to caution you, using a service is fine. However, two things you need to realize. One, if it's a large service that's dedicated to the financial industry, the same content is, is stuff that other people just like you can post. I can't tell you the number of times I go on LinkedIn and I see, you know, one financial person with this post and then I read somebody else and it's the exact same post. And the only thing that makes me think is this, both of those people are just auto generating and auto populating something to have activity, but they're not thinking about it and it does nothing for their brand. It, they don't look like experts. They look like, they're just using some kind of a systematized way to do that. So you have to think about that. If you're going to use something like that, that's compliance friendly, find a way to still personalize it. So that way it comes across like you thought about it, because guess what? You should think about it before you just let it auto post. There are things that you can do to personalize it. You can't change certain parts of that stuff, but you can at least have an extra sentence or two or a hashtag or this or that, that maybe at least then it seems like it came more from you that you thought about it and you had your audience in mind when you did it. So that's my final point on social media, digital, et cetera. We do have, I think, a little bit of time left, Zach. So lay it on me, folks. Thanks so much, Brian. Really appreciate your time. No, no problem. Really appreciate it. Um, don't have any questions right now. Uh, some may come along in the chat, but uh, just wanted to say, I uh, appreciate it. I really uh, enjoyed all the new updates to this presentation as well. Um, I do want to challenge people that are on the call to uh, definitely look at their LinkedIn profiles and maybe make some edits. If, it, if it's been a while, haven't made some uh, changes to it, just take a look, maybe add, a, add some spice to your bios, something like that, yeah. Yeah, like I said, um, take a look at mine as an example. I'm not saying mine's the best. It just tells you that it's it's different. It's definitely different, right? It is, I, I, I've got securities license all this. So everything that I do, I, I still have to go through compliance. So that's, I think, the other thing that a lot of times people tell me, you know, they think that we just can't do things because compliance is going to tell you no. Well, sometimes that's true, but you'd be surprised that if you actually – you know, if you have a compliance dynamic, start to figure out what you can do and don't assume that it's always no. And I'll be honest, compliance officers appreciate you trying to understand and engaging with them about it. Say, hey, I'm thinking about this or I'd like to do this. Have a dialogue, right? There's a lot that you might be able to accomplish. Um, you know, when, and again, you, you, you will probably be surprised because, because our industry has been impacted digitally like i said we've been disrupted compliance has had to change as well uh and so you might be surprised um and if you have issues 
reach out to me directly. I'm happy to help you talk to a finance or to a compliance officer. Um, I love, I wanted to get, if Gibson's still on, he said, I'm a financial GPS. I want to know more about that and understand how that kind of plays out. But looks like he had to jump off, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting one for sure. <laughs> well, uh, hey, again, really appreciate your time and your expertise. Um, just want to let everyone know that next week's class is leadership in the industry and your community. So a good one if you have not gotten too involved um, inside and outside of the industry. Uh, uh, great presentation. There are tons of stuff to look forward to. And um, this presentation was recorded and will be available on demand at a later date. And stay tuned for more updates on the program. And Brian, thanks again for, uh, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Love it. Absolutely. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good one.